Let's do it. Okay, so hopefully this is going to work. This is my first time of recording something like this, and, and we'll see how we can call it up later in archives. And, and if people miss the program, they can maybe see it anyway through the recording process. Um, so before we close, I'll be highlighting our future talks and dates. In fact, our next speaker is already uh, logged in. Karen Johnson's going to be our next speaker. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's begin with Drew. Well, I want to give him plenty of time here. So uh, Drew Crooks, a noted local historian with a very historic family. I mean, history, it actually involved in history anyway. Drew and Jennifer are both uh, historians uh, following in his footsteps. And uh, Drew is well versed in the Hudson's Bay Company and how we Americans related to them here in Thurston County in particular. Uh, his talk, his title, in fact, the, what really intrigued me was the name Tenelquat. I've heard Tenelquat used in the history notes that I've come across, but it was such a cute name and a fun name. I thought, well, what is a Tenelquat? And it's actually a location. And so his, his talk is titled Outpost of Empire, the Hudson's Bay Company in Tenel, or at Tenelquat, Thurston County. So Tenelquat is in Thurston County, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Drew and and uh, you're already unmuted, and I think I've got the screen share all set for you, so I'll, I'll mute myself and let you get started. Thank you, Drew. Well, thank you. Let's, okay. Um, oh, we see the screen share set up. Oh, ask if they can see it. Can everybody see the, the, the slide? Oh, oh, yeah, my brother said yes. Yeah, okay. okay. So just hit those buttons. Okay. That button or that button? Just hit this button, big button. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Drew Crooks. And uh, yes, I really like the Hudson's Bay Company. And uh, I'm honored to be here today. Um, and thank you for all coming to, to see my program. Um, there are many historical places in Thurston County including, you know, a lot in Tumwater itself. I believe that one of the most historical sites in this county is Tenequat. Uh, at Tenequat was an outpost of the British Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, where Euro-Americans, people from Europe and from the East Coast of, of America, and Native Americans worked together in the mid 19th century. It's a, Tenacqua is a subject I've been interested in for a long time, uh, researching it off and on for years, probably starting about 1986, when I participated in a study of HBC sites in um, Pierce and Thurston counties uh, that was organized by Kathy Jervig, who was a Fort Lewis archeologist at the time. But before I get into my talk, I'd like to thank a few people. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the Washington State Library and the staff there for providing key historical information to me, to my family for the strong support of my historical work, <clears throat> and the Olympia Tumwater Foundation, especially Don Trosper, for arranging this talk today. Now, let's, let's look at a history of a place with a really most unusual name, Tenequat. What is Tenequa? It's a place. It's the name of a prairie or flat grassland in South Thurston, South Central Thurston County. It's located about, I guess you would say 12 miles Southeast of Olympia, next to the Deschutes River between Tenino and Rainier. If you look at this map, you get a kind of idea of, of Tenequa. Uh, it's, it's interesting because the, the urban area of Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater is fairly you know, well populated. And once you get a Tenequat, well, you're out in the countryside. This is a, a satellite view of the Tenequat area, uh, thanks to Google. And um, it's, it's much of it is still a prairie today, uh, particularly the part that's run by JBLM. Um, the other areas is pasture land, but some, there are some houses in this area now. Tenequat has an interesting um, geological history to it. 
It's a dry glacial outwash prairie that was formed at the end of the last ice age. Oh, I've heard talk of 12,000 years ago, 14,000 years ago, 16,000 years ago, somewhere in that range. Like other prairies in the region, when the glaciers retreated during a time of warming climate, a large gravelly outwash plain with well-drained soil was created. And then prairie plants could grow in, in, in this new habitat. <clears throat> One thing I find interesting is the name itself. And <coughs> like a lot of words that come from one language, Lushusi, Native American language, to English, there's many variations in the spelling. And you can see a few on this slide. Um, oftentimes the Hudson's Bay Company use an I instead of an E in the first syllable. But Tenaquat, the, the, the spelling Tenaquat, T-E-N-A-L-Q-U-O-T, um, I use that one because it appears in many historical records is the, the name used by most historians, and in addition, is the one that you find on the map today. But what I find interesting also is that Tenaquat comes from Lushutsi, the Native American language spoken by, the, nat by the, the Native people of the Puget Sound region. And it comes from the phrase Tenaqua, which means the best yet. Um, and Tenaquath is related to the migration story of the Nisqually people. And it's very rare to have a story like this preserved. Much of the oral history of the native peoples were unfortunately lost during the tough transition of the 19th century. But in 1918, W.P. Bonney, who was secretary of the Washington State Historical Society in Tacoma, or really, um, he was the head of the, of the society, uh, recorded the migration story told to him by Henry Saikay, who was a noted Koala tribal leader. And so I, I'll quote from the letter he wrote, I told you I would try and get the meaning of the word Tenakot, or Tenakot, as the old Indians pronounce it. I had depended on Henry Saikay, and he just gave me the story yesterday, which he got from an old Nisqually Indian last week and had it confirmed by an old Indian woman. The story runs like this. Many years ago, the mink, which was the Indian's impersonation of the one who goes over the country seeking good locations for the habitations of men, came overland from the Columbia River. In his journey, he found many obstacles. There was no road or trail through the thick timber and brush, the hills he had to cross were rough and covered with stones so that his feet became very sore. One evening, he came to a beautiful prairie. It was covered with waving grass and bright flowers. Throwing his hands up into the air, he shouted, Tanaka, meaning the best yet. Or as Sake said, it may be literally translated, happy land. I kind of like that happy land. Or So, Informed by Mink of this promising land, the Nisqually tribe migrated to Tinaquat Prairie first, and then they went to the other places or Nisqually watershed. Tinaquat Prairie, like other prairies in the region, had many natural resources useful to Native American. There's a reason why Mink would call this the happy land not just because of how it looked, but because of things on the land uh, that they could use. And the two botanists, Linda Storm and Donelia Chavez, have described some of these reasons. Wild sunflower, tiger lily, wild carrots or jampa, camas, Indian rice root, or chocolate lily, and false onions were gathered. Wild sunflower roots were mashed to make a root beer-like beverage. Strawberries, service berries, or June berries, and other berries were gathered in June and eaten fresh or dried and stored for winter. Acorns and hazelnuts were harvested in the fall. Acorns were either placed in mud banks for winter to leach out the, the toxins in them or cooked overnight on hot rocks in a pit. 
bracken fern, rhizomes were also harvested, toasted in Large quantities of roots, berries, and acorns were processed and stored for winter along with smoked salmon and other meats, including deer, elk, bear, and small mammals, end of quote. So there was a lot of resources. And what's interesting about a prairie, it's not just the resources on the prairie, it's also the fact that it's next to the Deschutes River, which has water resources, and it's also near uh, forests too, so woodland resources. Um, what I find particularly interesting is that the prairies in this region, like Tenaquat Prairie, and there's other prairies too, would naturally have disappeared as the climate grew wetter and cooler, leading to the expansion of Douglas fir forests onto the grasslands. But the Native Americans themselves maintained the prairies through intentional burnings. So that would burn off the, the, the trees and leave and the prairie plants could survive. And what's um, kind of neat today is environmentalists are working to preserve the remaining dry prairies of the region. And this includes the practice of controlled burning too. Now, one thing that's kind of kind of interesting is that Tenaquat Prairie with, had a ford at the Deschutes River there. So it was a place easy to cross the Deschutes River. It served as a transportation corridor for Native Americans. Um, and if you look at this 1856 survey map, you can see the trail highlighted in, in yellow on the, going from the lower left to the up to the center right. And this trail probably existed hundreds, thousands of years, who knows. Um, it was a trail used by the Native Americans. And then it was also used by the first Euro-Americans in this region, the employees of the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay Company was a, business, a British business that was formed in 1670. It started operations in North America at Hudson's Bay. That's why they got the name Hudson's Bay Company or HBC. And um, once I gave a talk on the HBC at the Evergreen State College for three hours, and um, I'll try to keep my talk a little more concise today. Um, but for centuries, the company operated in North America, mainly trading furs with the native, with the native people and selling them in Europe. Uh, but they got involved in all other types of business operations because it was a practical business, always trying to make money. And it's funny to see that the company, how it changed over the years. And today, they is still Hudson's Bay Company. They run a chain of department stores in Canada called The Bay. Um, there's a big one in Victoria and probably one in Vancouver too. So it's a company that was very pragmatic, practical, but was always a business too. In the early 19th century, the Hudson's Bay Company had trading posts across what is now Canada. So Canada wasn't formed in 1869, so it's pre-Canada. And also in the Pacific Northwest. Now what makes the Northwest interesting at this time is that it's claimed by both Great Britain and the United States. And so both had claim to this area and the British uh, government was basically represented by the, by the Hudson's Bay Company and its operations. Now, over time, fur trading became less important to the HBC in the Pacific Northwest as the fur bearing animals were hunted down and they dwindled in number and the European markets for furs declined. Uh, one of the most important factors, and it's a strange one now, is at one time, uh, top hats in Britain and probably in Europe itself, were made of beaver felt. Well, it changed to silk. And so that really hurt the market for, for fur trade. The HBC being practical thought, well, how, how else can we make money in the Northwest? And they went into large scale farming. Now, they, at, at the different places, they, they had agricultural products, both crops and livestock, which they didn't just 
produced and consumed it there, they traded it around the world. And they sold a lot of uh, products to Russian Alaska, Mexico, Mexican California, then later American California, the Hawaiian Kingdom, and Europe. It truly was an international business operation. And I think one of the most interesting things is um, the Hudson's Bay Company, for example, sold um, salted or pickled salmon to the Hawaiian Kingdom, to Hawaii, or the Sandwich Islands even, it's called. And it became very popular, this pickled salmon. And when you go to a luau in Hawaii, even now, one of the dishes is kind of a salted pickled salmon, uh, uncooked. And that still is popular now, you know, 150 years later, a lot of time have passed by. Now, the HPC uh, legally could not operate farms. Kind of a strange thing, but it derives from their charter signed by the King of England. So they had to completely set up um, another company that they completely dominated that did the farming technically, even though the HBC and the P and the, this other company were really the same company. But legally, they were separate companies. And this other company that was set up in 1838 to manage the farms in the Pacific Northwest. It was called the Puget Sound Agricultural Company or PSAC. So the PSAC and HBC had a whole network of posts in the region. Now, what's interesting is that in 1846, the United States and Great Britain came to um, uh, sign a treaty that divided this land, the Northwest between them. They, they settled their, their, their claims. And the boundary was set up at the current air national boundary between the US and, and the British Empire would be at Canada, the, court, the current Canadian border. Uh, in the treaty itself, the rights of the HBC and PSAC were protected. That means the land they own, the operations they were doing, they were protected under the treaty and could continue on under, uh, you know, even though the Americans technically, well, ruled this area down south of the new border. And it took years of negotiation, but only after the HBC PSAC rights were purchased by the American government in 1869, did the company cease their operation south of the border. So Fort Nisqually, for example, uh, closed down in 1870. In any case, back, going back into time to the 1850s, uh, in the mid 19th century, the HBC PSAC uh, employees traveled between the posts by water and land. This included using the Tinaqua Prairie uh, Trail which was a part of the old Calix Trail or the Calix Portage, as it was usually called back then by the company. And that, that went from Calix Farm near Toledo, Washington, up to Fort Nisqually, which was a HBC PSAC post up in what is now DuPont. Now, usually the journeys on the trail proved relatively uneventful, but that was not true for one HBC party in 1845. At that time, a group of company employees led by Henry Peer, P-E-E-R, brought a large shipment of land ardor skins, which were quite valuable to the company, over the trail. They traveled from Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, up the Callis River, then to Callis Farm, then over the Portage to Fort Nisqually in November, 1845. Now, that was a bad time to travel. November 1845, heavy rain, lots of rain. And so when the party of 18 men came up to the Deschutes River at Tenaquah, they didn't see, this is what the river normally looks like in Tenaquah. This is a picture uh, that we, we took last summer of, um, of, the, um, of the river. It's a very peaceful river. But in November 1845, it's a raging river. And so, the group could not cross at the ford. They couldn't go across. They had a lot of horses. 
a lot of uh, furs, a lot of supplies, 18 men, and they couldn't go across. They ran out of food. They even killed eight one of their horses, which for a company employee was about the last resort to do. Um, so in desperation, they got a message sent to Fort Nisqually for help. And the commander of Fort Nisqually, the famous Dr. William Tolman, sent an emergency packet of supplies and provisions, as well as some horses to the stranded group. Pierre's party got the help. They were now able to cross the Deschutes River. Now, how that was done, unfortunately, the records don't say, but I think they had some type of raft they built and they crossed over. Uh, they went on to Fort Nisqually and successfully completed their mission, but the whole trip took 12 days. And you think of how you go from, you know, Tumwater down to Toledo, you could do it, you know, part of a day. It took 12 days to do the whole trip. It was, it was tough. Now, there doesn't seem to be a HBC PSAC outstation or outpost at Tenacqua at the time of the Piers group passage in 1845. Uh, some historians think so, but my thinking is that if this party was trapped and needed help, why wouldn't they consult or help work with the Tenacqua outstation? They had to go to Fort Nisqually. So I'm thinking there's no outstation in 1845, but that would change soon. By the late 1840s, the HBC PSAC controlled a vast area of 150,000 acres between the Puyallup and the Nisqually River. Uh, Fort Nisqually served as the local headquarters. As historian George Dickey stated, all of this land could not be worked from the Fort Nisqually farm. So outstations or strategically placed farms were located in the area between the two rivers. This is a map done in 1855 by the company, PSAC. It's kind of distorted. Um, in the circle down in the lower circle, that's the site of Fort Nisqually. In the upper circle, that's the site of Stillicum Barracks or Fort Stillicum. This is 1855. Um, it shows the positions of some of the outposts or outstations of the company um, in Paris County between the Puyallup and Nisqually River. It does not show anything below the Nisqually River, but there was a few outstations even south of the river in what is now Thurston County. This included Tenaquan. All these farms were connected. They had people constantly going from one place to another, supplies, uh, messages going from one to another. It was a network of operations. Um, there were several reasons for the establishment of the Tenaqua Outstation, the outpost of Empire on the, on the Deschutes. And the major reason was that it was a great place to have a farm. It was, um, uh, you could grow crops, but particularly the pasture land was excellent for animals like sheep and horses and cattle. And so it was an excellent place to, to pick, but also, Thinking back to what happened to the Pierce party, it, would, it, was, it was great to have a way station on the old Calix Portage or Calix Trail that employees of the company or other people could stop at and get supplies. So it was a way station on the trail too. Now, the question comes to mind, when exactly was Tenaquat Outstation Outpost founded? No one knows for sure. Uh, the surviving evidence seems to indicate the late 1840s. And definitely by the fall of 1848, Tenaquat Farm existed. At that time, the Fort Nisqually records show evidence of uh, rations and other supplies being sent to the, to the outpost. So let's look at this, this page. And these are some of the record. This is the typical record from the Hudson's Bay Company. Actually, this is one of the neat pages. Uh, oftentimes, they're a lot more messier than this. If you look to the, the, the bottom part of the page, the part circled in black, that's a, a memo 
uh, November 30th, 1848. <laughs> and it talks about sending uh, rations to Tenequah. Uh, they're spelling Tenequah T-I-N in this one. Uh, and they're sending a thousand pounds of salted beef, 10 bushels of peas, and 130 pounds of fine flour. And it's an advance to last them for three months. This is not the only food that people had down there. They also got their own food. Their families helped acquire food, but this was some kind of the basic food that they had to, to eat. Um, the Tenaquart Outpost, when it was started in 1848, let's say, um, it came into existence at a time of growing conflict over land between the HPC, PSAC companies and the increasing numbers of American settlers entering the region. HBC, their activity, the company's activities at Tenaquat and elsewhere south of the Nisqually River was on especially shaky ground due to American pressure. The two companies really had a stronger claim north of the Nisqually River. Their extension south of the river was later and, and weaker. Now, what was at Tenaquat? Well, it was a whole community of people. Uh, they had lots of buildings. Um, they would have dwelling houses, sheds, barns, corrals, et cetera. Uh, it was a large flourishing farm. Only, we only have specific information about one building though. And that's this block house because it was photographed several times before it was burned in the 1930s. The inscription on this, um, on this uh, photo is a little bit misleading. It was a, a storehouse, a granary. It was not an Indian fort. Uh, the, the person that's mentioned OA Page Farm, he actually leased um, the, the land as a farm early in the 20th century. That's why his name is there. The Tenaquark Block House was built during the 1840s. It was, not, it was used for many years as a granary and storehouse. Fire unfortunately destroyed the historic building in the 1930s. And what a great historical loss that was. There's so few Hudson's Bay Company buildings that still survive. Uh, there's two up at the reconstructed post uh, up at Point Defiance that were moved there, but uh, just very few. And uh, there's so much history with these buildings. The first manager um, of uh, Tenaquat Farm that we know about was Matthew Nelson. And his HPC service record indicates he joined the company from Quebec around 1844. And he oversaw the post Tenaquat from 1848 to 1849. His command of the farm, farm ended up very abruptly in 1849. At this time, 1849, you have the California gold rush. Uh, news reached the Pacific Northwest. A lot of people left to go down to California. Uh, the pull of the gold was really strong. Now, the people that stayed in the Northwest thought, well, geez, all these people left. There's less people here. Um, there's um, a lack of labor. We need a pay raise. So some of the HBC came together and asked the HBC officials for a pay raise. Uh, no, no pay raise. <laughs> and so the Matthew Nelson left like about two days later, later and um, now there's a number of people from the Northwest that went to California during this time that we never heard what happened to. It's possible he changed his name, became a wealthy man. It's possible he was killed. It's possible he died. We just had Northwest. This is the man most closely associated with Tenaquat, and he was the next and last manager of the operations there, Thomas Linkletter. We know a lot about his life. He was born about 1815 on the Orkney Islands of Scotland. This archipelago lies off the northeast coast of Scotland, of the Scottish mainland, and 
it's a remarkable place. Uh, one thing is there's no trees there, but it also has one of the highest concentration of prehistoric ruins in Europe uh, on the Orkneys. But in any case, it was there was close ties between the Orkney Islands and the Hudson's Bay Company for hundreds of years. The islands served the company as a port of call for supplies and a source of manpower. Numerous Orkney men worked with HBC in the New World. Company officials considered them especially hardworking and loyal. And Thomas Linkletter here certainly falls into that category. In May 1833, Thomas Linkletter signed up for HBC services, for service. He joined at Stromness, a port town on the Orkney Island, and this is confusion, confusing. The island is called Mainland, but really it's an island. <laughs> It's the island off the mainland, but uh, the mainland off the mainland. And, but it was the center of company activity in the archipelago. Originally, he contracted for five years to work for the company as a laborer, earning 17 pounds sterling yearly. He would work for the company for almost 20 years. The HBC sent him to Columbia District in the Pacific Northwest. He worked at Fort Vancouver, Fort McLaughlin, on the steamer Beaver and then Fort Nisqually. So in 1849, he's at Fort Nisqually. Matthew Nelson leaves abruptly, quits. Linklater is sent to take his place by William Tomey. And for almost two years, Thomas Linklater managed Tinaquat. Um, his annual wages as head shepherd was 30 pounds in 1850 and 27 pounds in 1851. You may say, why the decrease? probably reflecting the, the market because of the gold rush. It's hard to say at this point of time. Um, Linklater was not alone. He was also helped by his wife, Mary, who uh, was the farm, and she was Native American, the daughter of a Shimchanian uh, chief. And the Shimchanian Native people have lived along the central coast of British Columbia. And I should note that many HBC PSAC men had Native American wives. Uh, Mary was noted as being a generous and kind-hearted woman. She was liked by both American settlers and HBC PSAC workers and frequently visited Fort Nisqually. The workers at Tenaquat, like other HBC PSAC posts, were multi-ethnic. They included Scots, Englishmen, French Canadians, Hawaiians, Native Americans, and individuals of mixed descent. Native Americans were especially important at Tenaquat. Most Native workers were employed for several months at a time. They were paid in credit at the Fort Nisqually store. Some of their names are preserved in surviving HBC PSAC records. In the 1849 to 1851 period, they included the individuals listed on this slide. Now, I believe more Native Americans worked there at the time. Uh, I just, I can't find the records on them. These are the ones that specifically said they went to Tenaquah. And for me, this is a highly significant list. Um, one thing that kind of stands out is among American settlers, it was quite common to give nicknames to Native Americans. So you say, well, Bob helps me at the farm or, or uh, Mary takes care of, 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 of the sheep, um, you, you, using English nicknames. Here, you can see that most of the names are attempts to use the Lushootsi Native American names. And I think that shows great respect between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Native Americans that actually use their names because some of them are, well, quite complicated. Um, and, and then the other thing is that uh, there are a few women in this group. And on the right side, there's a father-daughter team that worked there. Um, what's interesting is you get the sense at Tenaqua, I think this is a very important point about Tenaqua, is that we often see the past as conflict between groups and the conflict that happens, that's what's focused on. But here at Tenaquat, you see Native Americans and you see Euro-Americans working together to operate this farm. 
Now, they worked together because they both saw benefits from doing this. And it was um, a, a peaceful coexistence between the two groups. And I think of cooperation. Uh, I think in history, we need to look at those times and those occasions too, not just the, the conflict periods. Anyway, um, the, um, the individuals that worked there uh, had a extensive farm that grew crops, raised livestock, especially sheep. There were many sheep at Tenaquah. Over 2,600 sheep lived at the farm in June 1850. And the good pasture at Tenaquah Prairie also benefited HBC PSAC horses. Worn out horses from Fort Nisqually and its outstations were sometimes sent there for recovery. So if you had a horse at Fort Nisqually that wasn't doing too good, you sent it to Tenaquah to get well. And um, then they brought the healthy horses back from Tenaquah to work at other HBC PSAC posts. During these years of operation, the opposition by American settlers, many American settlers never, never, never ceased. And I think the reason for that is for many of the settlers coming out here, they, they were very much full of what I guess we can call manifest destiny. They felt that all of North America belonged to the Americans. And it was a form of American nationalism in the 19th century. Now, I can, I can add that there's a number of settlers that actually worked well with the company, got along well with the company. Um, uh, I see, I, I've seen records that, for example, the famous settlers of Tumwater, uh, Michael T. Simmons and George Bush, both worked for the Hudson's Bay Company for a period of time. Um, so it's not all American settlers, but many were, were very hostile to them. In view of this pressure and the fact that the claim south of the Nisqually River was weaker than the claim further north, uh, Chief Factor James Douglas at Fort Victoria finally decided that the, the company should abandon the Tenaquat site. He wrote William Tolming on August 7, 1851, quote, though it's very Of difficulty with them and not to that part of the country if he can possibly find a sufficient range north of the Nisqually River. In a quote, well, Tommy got the message from his boss and he complied with it. And uh, the, the Fort Nisqually Journal on November on September 11th, 1851, recorded that the set going down, um, well, Fiander and Topoi off to link letters with oxen and wagon for a load of wheat. No more sheep to be sent to ten o'clock. Link letter services no longer required. Charles sent to bring home the horses are with link letter and belonging to the company. Uh, the historian Cecilia Carpenter, the Nisqually his Indian historian, commented that, quote, perhaps Dr. Tomey felt that he should exert all his efforts to protect the original company claim between the two major rivers, Nisqually and Puala. There was plenty to tend to without continuing to cross the river and churning up trouble not needed, end of quote. So the company officially closed down operations at 10 o'clock and Linklater basically was let go. Um, so Thomas Linkler retired and he and his wife, well, no, I should say that. And Thomas Linkler retired and became an American citizen. He wanted to stay at 10 o'clock. So he took a donation land claim as an American citizen at the site. And the claim was 321 acres. And, um, and so that's, that was the site he took. And then he lived there the rest of his lives, both his life and his wife's lives. And they became, uh, Thomas and Mary became successful members of American Frontier Society. Business and social dealings between the Link Letters and Fort Nisqually also continued for a number of years. Now, there's something funny about this story, and that was the narrative I, um, I, I believe for many years. 
Then I did a study of what they call the agricultural censuses that the US government did every 10 years. And I looked at the 1860 census. So this is nine years after they closed Tenaqua as the HVC site. And I saw that in 1860 on the Linkletter farm, they had 1,151 sheep. Okay. Then in 1870, uh, what, what year that, that officially and truly the HBC closed all operations south of the border, there's no sheep at Tenaqua. Okay. So the question comes to mind, the sheep in 1860, nine years later, did they belong to Thomas and Mary Linkletter or were they company sheep that unofficially were still using the pasture land down at Tenaqua? And I tend to think that the company still maintained operations down there working with Thomas Linkler. They just were not official um, business relations. It was more like uh, they, that Thomas Linkler was, was overseeing company sheep down there. And that makes more sense to me what, what happened. Well, going back to the 1850s, oh, there. Um, the 1850s proved to be a, a, a very difficult decade for the Native Americans, for the Hudson's Bay Company, and probably for many of the American settlers too. Um, growing conflict between American settlers and Native Americans over land led to the Puget Sound War of 1855 to 56. This was directly related to the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854 that saw the purchase of native land for the, in the South Puget Sound region and the establishment of tribal reservation. Now, what's interesting is this war broke out and it was conflict all through the area. Uh, it would be seen as very minor skirmishes to us, but to the people living through it, it was, it was major. Thomas and Mary Linkler were not threatened and they survived the whole thing without physical injury or property damage at all. And what's interesting is across, just across from them, very near to them, was another um, DLC, donation land claim, by an American settler named Thomas Glasgow. And during the um, war, April, April 1856, uh, the Native Americans attacked Glasgow's farm. They wounded a farmhand, they stole horses and they burned a barn packed with grain. The Indians who raided the Glasgow farm were relatives of a man murdered by Glasgow in the early 1850s. So it was like Linklers were, the Native Americans had no trouble with the Linkletters, but with Glasgow, they had a lot of issues with. And so he was attacked and then Linkletter was nothing happened. Now at the same time, a little bit later, Washington Territorial Militia uh, soldiers uh, set up a little post at, at Linkletter Farm and they called it Camp Linkletter and they were to help protect the wheat supplies. And, and Thomas and Mary actually sold some of their grain and, and, and products to the, to the militia soldiers. Another interesting part of this history is the, the military role. After the end, of the Puget Sound War in 1856, and the return of peace to the area, the Americans built a road through Linkletter's farm on Tenacahua Prairie. Now, um, I should say it wasn't like a new road. They put this road right on top of the old, the old trail, the old Calix Trail, the old Calix Portage. So it followed the same path. And um, in, in this picture, you can see the, the current road which is called the military road, and it's the same path. Uh, it was part of a military road that connected Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River and Fort Stillicum near Puget Sound. In the 19th century, Congress uh, appropriated money to construct military roads throughout the American West for, for strategic reasons. They wanted to make easier the transportation of men and supplies between the military posts. So G.H. Mendel of the U.S. Army Topographical Engineers uh, put a notice in the Pioneer and Democrat newspaper of Olympia on March 27, 1857, calling for proposals to build the part of the 
Port Vancouver, Port Stillicon Military Road that included Tinnaquap Prairie. Um, and the road was to include a wooden bridge over the Deschutes River at Tinnaquap. They received the bids on April 25th and the work completed by November 1st, 1857. And, and they were built. Um, the bridge didn't last too long. Uh, they had disaster. It was reported in the Pioneer Democrat issue of July 23rd, 1858. Quote, the bridge across the Deschutes River near the residence of Mr. Thomas Linkletter of this county and on the military road leading from Monticello, which is Longview, to Fort Stillicum, gave way on Friday last and had become irreparably useless. It broke down under the weight of some eight or 10 beef cattle destined for the Stillicum market, the property of Mr. Bird and his brothers of Pierce County. One of the two of the stock was seriously crippled and Mr. Bird escaped merrily going down with the bridge. The bridge and the contract as far as completed having been received by Mr. Mendel, the topographical engineer, it may be some time before the bridge would be reconstructed. Well, that was an understatement because another bridge over the Juice Chutes River at, at Tenaquat was not built until 1894, decades later. And in fact, there, there was a series of bridges and um, the current bridge um, dates back only to the 1960s a concrete bridge. Thomas and Mary Linkletter continued to farm at Tinnacoff Prairie for many years. On March 30th, 1884, Mary passed away at 10 o'clock. Thomas died on February 20th, 1890 at St. Peter Hospital, Olympia. They were buried near the old block house on the Tinnacoff farm. The grave is still marked today by the original stone obelisk set up in memory of the couple. And here's a picture of that. More than a thousand acres of land were left in Linkletter's estate. This included his donation land claim plus 700 acres he bought in addition to that over the years. He left the, the land for his grandchildren, Henry and Thomas Barnhill, sons of Robert James Barnhill and Margaret Linkletter Barnhill. Since 1890, the Barnhill, this is in sequence through time. The Barnhill first, the Groundwater, and the Schoenbachler families have owned the land that, have been the, that had been the Tenaquat outstation. This is what it looks like to, in recent years. What I find amazing about Tenaquat is that the area still remains agricultural. Over 150 years since the time of the HBC PSAC farm, an outpost of empire that once flourished on the prairie next to the Deschutes River flowing north to Bud Inlet. Thank you. Uh, I'd be glad to take some questions now. All right. Um, maybe we can uh, get out of the screen share and everybody can see each other a little bit better that way, perhaps. That's a. Yeah, this one there. Yeah. All right. Got Jennifer in there. Yeah. Hi. Okay, there we go. All right. Well, uh, anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment or whatever, you can uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. I see Pete Komet unmuted himself. Uh, I have a, a great presentation, uh, presentation, Drew. Really appreciate the information. Um, where was the crossing for the Nisqually River? Oh, oh, you mean the crossings in the, the old river? Okay, there's, there's three different crossings and um, of the Nisqually River, there's a... Hmm, hmm. I, I, don't, I don't have that information at my finger points that if, if you, I, I can send it to Don Trosper, he can pass it on to you. Uh, Cecilia Carpenter wrote a really interesting article that talks about the different crossing, historical crossing. And um, I can send that to, I can send that to Don and he can, he can send that on to you if you wish. So the, the military road, did it continue more or less straight 
towards the Nisqually or did it yeah, veer yes, off it towards did. Yelp? Yes, it did. Um, okay. Well, what's interesting about the military road is when I first learned of the military road, I thought, wow, this was the basic road used for decades and used for time. But there was a problem with the military road program. The US military, the US government paid for it being built, but they would not pay for maintaining it. Mm. And so the, the roads continued, but they really deteriorated quite rapidly after building. Mm. Uh, there are places up north, I think in King County and Pierce County that are part of the military road. And then of course there's other military roads in other parts of Washington too. Yeah. Thank okay. you. I see uh, unmuted Robin and also Steve. Uh, Robin, what are I, I, I do have a question. Um, is the link later grave visitable by the public? No, no, it's on private land. In fact, I, I should point that out. Um, it, it's on it's on private land. It's a working rent or no farm or ranch now. And uh, there's a you know barbed wire fence, and it, it's not really for the public to see. That's probably why it's still there. I mean, yeah. Yeah. If it's out there by itself and not in an established cemetery by now, and were accessible to the public. It would probably have been vandalized long ago. Yeah, and that's that's not that's not a picture I took. That's a picture I I, I got. Okay, Steve Poggy, you have a question wondering how the Hudson Bay man did they become uh, citizens uh, and, uh, or did most of them go north to you know when we present account well that's a, that's an interesting question uh, there was a group called uh, descendants of Fort Nisqually employees that I, I gave several talks to decades a couple of decades ago it doesn't exist anymore but there are descendants of Fort Nisqually employees here in the northwest here in Puget Sound and um, the, some, a number of them became American citizens, actually. One of the most famous is Edward Huggins, who um, was the last commander of Fort Nisqually. He became an American citizen. He was the Pierce County auditor for a while um, and ran a, a farm up there at Fort Nisqually. Um, others did go back up. They, they went up north of the border, up to Victoria, up to New British Columbia. Mm. Interesting. Could I add something, please? I, I, I have a background in Canadian history, yeah. which which covers some of, you know, it, it, it intersects some of these issues. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I can add that during the period where American settlers and Canadians shared this part of the world, um, the, uh, the Hudson's Bay men fell under increasing scrutiny from a certain class of American uh, settler that resented their presence. And during the blockhouse wars, uh, that, that class of American settler was pretty darn sure that these, that these people who, who they called the squaw men because they were married to native women were, were in uh, sympathy with the uprising natives. And they made life very hot for, 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 for those men. And so some of them, some of them did leave uh, one of the, one of the really uh, prominent roles that they played in local history here was those Hudson's Bay men, or, or in some case, former Hudson's Bay men, were very unhappy with what happened to Leshai. Mm. And, they, and they let that be known, which, which caused their situation to get hotter still. But anyway, I, I, I just wanted to add that, that there was, right. the harmony was not always perfect here. All right. Well, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this program. We do have to wrap things up since we're getting at the end of the time here, but uh, uh, feel free to contact us and we can get information back and forth to Drew also, and I'm sure he's willing to answer other questions you might have. Uh, we do have some more virtual talks coming up and you'll still need to pre-register through the City of Tumwater Parks and Recreation. And the next one is Karen Johnson and uh, Wednesday, March 9th. So the next talk is uh, the ar archives cur curator. And her talk is the Old Olympia Brewery, the non-beer years. So that's uh, for next month. And then the April talk will be Tonino City historian, Rich Edwards, and his book, The Naming of Tonino. And then and I have one more set here for Wednesday, May 11th, and that's author and former director of the Washington State Historical Society, David Nicandri, and his book, Captain Cook Rediscovered, Voyage to the Icy Latitude. <laughs> So those are the ones we have on the calendar so far. I haven't got a June one yet, but we'll keep working on that. 
And I hope you'll be able to, to join. And like I say, you have to go through Tumwater Parks and Recreation and want to thank them and the partnership with the foundation here, Olympia Tumwater Foundation. So thanks again to all of you for uh, your encouragement and participation. And I want to welcome you back again. Thank you so much for the successful. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi. Hi. Okay, let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Drew and Jennifer. Well, thank you. All right. You did great. All right. Okay, good. All right.